has given us hope that if it is implemented as intended, the pre-existing condition exclusion will be removed. That is huge. That is not to be underestimated. And that should give us hope that we are moving in the right direction. <laughs> further grounds for hope and further reason to believe we're making progress is that the same act is moving towards, once fully implemented, the end of a lifetime cap, a system which cruelly says, you've had enough health care, it doesn't matter if you need more, we're not going to give you any, you've cost us enough. Now go away, leave us alone, cost us no more. That is beginning to change. That is cause for hope. Last year, um, Representative Kefalis and I embarked on an effort which many told us was hopeless. And that was an effort to start keeping track of how much healthcare costs, how much is actually charged, how many readmissions there are, how many reinfections there are, how many tests are ordered, how many conditions are resolved quickly, how many are resolved slowly, how many are never resolved. Keeping track of our healthcare system, what is it doing? How much is it costing? And we've, uh, and Representative Kefalis and I embarked on a trip, on, a, on an effort, on a journey to make that all transparent through the all payer claims database, which many of you may know about. That we were told will never gain acceptance because the hospitals will find it not in their interests and they will destroy the effort before it really gets off the ground. Well, I'm here to tell you the hospitals did not derail the effort because the pressure to know more about how our system works is building and building and the frustration with not knowing what we are getting, how much we are paying, how effectively it is being rendered, that pressure is so strong that it has proved unstoppable and Nathan Wilkes and others are now working to put into practice that all payer claims database that we passed into law last year and the fact that it is moving forward when all thought that the hospitals could stop it is another reason for hope and another indication that we are making progress. Thank you. The, uh, another interesting political development that I found gave me hope was that, as everybody here knows, Rep U.S. Representative uh, Paul Ryan recently proposed, in line with the, uh, uh, with the advocates of extraordinary privatization of the healthcare system, further privatization of the healthcare system, in line with the aspirations of those that say, get the government out of the healthcare business. No community action for healthcare. Let it all be private arrangements. Representative Paul Ryan recently proposed and could have been thought to have been hailed with cheers if you looked at the town halls that railed and the Tea Party demonstrations and the objections to the Affordable Care Act. If you just looked at that and you le then listened to what Paul Ryan proposed, you would have thought this man will be hailed as a hero, his policies will be adopted by the Republican Party and even others, and he will be carried out on everybody's shoulders, but no, he is being pummeled to the ground and it is proved that it is the third rail of politics, just like touching Social Security. Keep your government hands off my Medicare, as somebody said to, as somebody said to uh, Barack Obama. But that is the will of the vast swath of the American people. And that to me is a very important development politically because we've seen people rail against government involvement in health care. But when you try and take the government out of Medicare, people suddenly wake up. People suddenly wake up. And that reaction by the public in the United States is also room for hope and room that we are making progress that our message 
that we must act collectively as a people for those that don't have adequate health care. Our message is getting through. But this does not mean that we don't sometimes get discouraged. I remember one late evening, uh, on, uh, we had been all day and most of the night sitting in uh, the Legislative Services Building A across the street from the Capitol, having hearings of the House Finance Committee on which I serve. And I sit next to Representative Kefalas, who, as I'm sure you all know, is small in height, but magnificently large in stature. <laughs> He's a giant. And it is my privilege to sit with him, next to him, on that committee. And at the end of that particular committee hearing, which I remember so well, we were all tired. We didn't stop until about 11 o'clock that night. There were a lot of bills on our agenda. And I sat there, and I had my head in my hands, and John, in his kindly manner, put his hand on my shoulder and said, are you OK? And I said, John, I'm tired. I'm tired, depressed. I'm discouraged. We had just voted two votes, among many others, that particularly disturbed me. We had voted that we could afford to give a tax incentive, a tax incentive to make tax-free agricultural inputs, that is, pesticides, yeah, <laughs> pesticides, fertilizers, and bull semen. These are uh, costly <laughs> agricultural inputs for which w we gave tax-free status by a vote of seven to six. Now, you know, I don't think the bulls would be any less enthusiastic about producing semen even if it were taxed. Uh, I don't think they need the incentive. But our opponents on the committee thought otherwise, and we passed that, and it was determined that we could afford that. And in the same hearing, we were told that we could not afford to increase aid for the needy disabled from a measly $140 a month to $200 a month. So we were in the same meeting giving tax breaks to agriculture and denying tiny amounts of money to make the difference between destitution and indignity to the very poorest who were physically disabled and unable to work and had spent every dime they have. And so I shook my head and I said, John, I'm discouraged. And he said to me, go home. Get some sleep. I'll see you on the floor tomorrow morning. I'm going to bring you something. And I came the next morning, and John was there. And he gave me a DVD of a movie called Amazing Grace. And he said, watch this. And that night, I went home. And I watched Amazing Grace. And I didn't know until I watched the movie why John had given it to me. The movie told the story of the movement to abolish slavery in Britain, which came 50, 60 years before the movement really took root in the United States. And it told of how one man, Thomas Clarkson, was incensed at the injustice. And he recruited another man who was a member of parliament called William Wilberforce. And then they sat together and they recruited some ex-slaves to educate them about it. And they sat in their living rooms 
and they sat and discussed how to go about making a difference to this dreadful state of affairs. And they then started meeting, and they met. And they met in church basements, like we are here in a church basement. And for 20 years, William Wilberforce stood at first lonely and mocked and despised in the House of Commons and railed against the evil of the slave trade. For 20 years he continued. For 20 years that group continued to meet. They got bigger. They got stronger. They got more educated. They got more powerful. Their message started getting through. And after 20 long, hard, arduous years, a bill was passed abolishing the slave trade in Great Britain. And then 50 or 60 years later, the same movement spread across the Atlantic. And as I watched that film, I knew then why John had given it to me. Because that film told me, never give up, never be discouraged, never underestimate the power of a few people who care, getting together, exchanging ideas, gathering, strategizing, thinking, how can we make a difference? How can we end an injustice? How can we make the world better? How can we make progress happen? They did it then. They were the giants of their time. You're doing it now. You are the giants of this time. I cannot tell you how privileged and honored I feel to be here standing with you today because I think that 10, 15, 5, 20 years from now, I don't know when we will achieve absolutely universal, affordable, effective health care for every American. But I know that somewhere, sometime, someone will sit and will tell their children about the days when health care was not available to all. And they'll say, you know, it's hard to believe, but that's the way it was. But we got together and we changed it. And proudly, those people will say to their children, I was there. I was there. I helped do it. We did it. And we will. And we will not rest until it is done. And for that, you have my eternal gratitude. Thank you. Well, my friends, we promised you inspiration this morning. I think we just got it. Thank you so much, Representative Kagan. And kind of in, re in reflection and appreciation, we have a certificate for you, Certificate of Excellence in Healthcare Reform from Healthcare for All Colorado. Thank you again, Representative Reagan. K Kagan. <laughs> Before we break for, for lunch, I want to all...